shortly. So we are in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews 12. Brother Joe Hendricks will be with us next Wednesday night in case I ain't able. So I have my procedure Tuesday, so in case I'm not fitted for church Wednesday night, we're going to have Brother Joe Hendricks preach to us a little bit. And hopefully I'll be up and running well. <laughs> we'll see how all that goes. Uh, remember that. Pray. I got uh, CAT scan done today. The lungs is checking that out. We'll follow up with that on Monday. So have that in your prayer request as we we go forward. All right. We're looking at Hebrews chapter number 12. We went up through verse 11, speaking of the chastening hand of the Lord last week with his children. Those that are without the chastening hand, of course, are not his children. And there's a word used there that's the word that meant for youngins that don't have or know their father. And oftentimes people in our day use that in a bad context, a wrongful context, or a malicious context. Um, but there at verse number 8, talks about those that are not of the Lord. He whoops his own. And the others he'll deal with at the judgment seat or the white, great white throne of judgment. So... Um, they get some dealings in these days, but they also will, they will get the severe, severity of their punishment at the great white throne of judgment. So we're going to drop in at verse number 12 this evening and try to uh, get through a large portion, closing out um, this chapter, hopefully, maybe, um, We'll not, we'll not get into a lot of the, fa fa the last of the chapter, but we'll get through, at least through Esau's part there. We'll deal with that tonight. Verse 12 says this, Hebrews 12, verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring, springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who, is, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And uh, we'll see about verse 18, probably try to get to that a little bit later. But I want to deal with this, this set of verses here. There's a lot of, of good topical study in just these few verses. Uh, the root of bitterness is, is a message all of itself. But we're not preaching a message. We're trying to deal with a Bible study on it, so we're going to deal with it, try to stay within this context and not launch out into a message of that. Uh, it also talks about those with the, with the hands and the, and the feeble knees, and we're going to deal with that as well. And then Esau itself is a good topic to study. And I invite you and encourage you to study a little bit about Esau. Esau is a good uh, he's a good debate among the preachers and the students of the Bible. Uh, a lot of folks will argue intensively about Esau and many things with his life. So it's, it's good. Uh, it's good study. Uh, remember, cardinal truths of the Word of God we must agree upon. Salvation by grace through faith. The Trinity. Baptism is a a uh, showing of salvation, not part of the salvation act itself. Cardinal truths, we're going to settle on those. But some of these other things we can, we can um, as some says, dicker around or talk about them a little bit, you know, and have conversation without getting too mad at each other. Amen? So I know uh, people that 
I really want to be right, I want to be right all the time, and they're always right all the time, and what someone else's opinion is is nothing. So I've dealt with all kinds of debaters. But when you study it word for word and you get into the context of what the Lord has written here, and when you study these words out, it, it brings a pretty decisive conclusion. It's not a lot of debate left out there if you study it in context. And if you try to study it out to make it fit a certain denomination or a certain set of guidelines, or you try to study it out to make it fit a certain lifestyle that you want to permit, or to denounce, well, then you got problems. So what you do when you study the Word of God, you study it jot upon jot, tittle upon tittle, and you stay within the context of what you're studying, and therefore you'll come to a spiritual, spirit-influenced discernment of what God's just saying. So let's dive in. Wherefore, lift up uh, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Now, I want you to notice, and y'all know I'm not going to try to be an English scholar tonight, but contrary to your understanding, I do know a little bit more about it than you think I know. <laughs> but when you study this out and study how the Lord has laid it out, and you study the colons and the semicolons and the whys that are there, it gives you some meaning and the connections of the meanings. And it helps you to get a little more understanding when you do that a little bit. So we will endeavor a little bit on that tonight in our study because it is important. Now, remember, we are studying Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews fits in the Bible the same as any other book. And when you study in context, what we study in Hebrews 12 will line up with the themes of the Bible. So let's not lose that. Remember that. Salvation's plan don't change. So you keep that in mind as you study these, then you can draw, draw a better conclusion, if you will. So when we started out this chapter, we started out talking about the Christian and his race. Remember that? He talked about wherefore, seeing we also were compassed about. Wherefore, what was the wherefore there? Taking us back to remember those folks in chapter 11 that were of the hall of fame of faith. Those that lived by faith and went through trials and persecutions and even unto death. Remember those folks when we run our race. He starts it off with that. As we come down to where we are now, notice what he's saying. Follow, uh, uh, lift up the hands which are hanged down and the, the feeble knees. And when you get into this and begin to study out what he's talking about, remembering the race we're running, the hands are down. You ever seen a race, uh, a runner run a race and you ever watch him when his hands is hanging down? He ain't doing good. A runner, a racer, has got his hands up here. They're helping to motivate and helping drive him as he runs that race. When them hands goes down, he's shot. He's wore out. He's done. He's about to fall over. And you get into this study of the weak hands, uh, the, the, feeble, the uh, hanging hands and the feeble knees. You get into studying that. I, I've done some studies with several different writers. Of, of course, I do that. Y'all know that by now. Uh, Dr. Green says that the onset of this chapter where it admonished to run with patience the race that is set before us. Do we desire to run this race victorious? If we do, we must lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily beset us, regardless of what that sin is. We must run. We must run it with patience. We must not forget. Uh, we must not fret or become discouraged. We must know that what happens along the way, God has mapped out the course, and he, and he commanded the race. If we look to Jesus... All else, demand, all else demanded of us is to run, and we know that's, that's, that's the course that the Lord has laid out for us. So when we get to looking at this, he's using a word here that's going to tie into our study tonight when he got, got to talking about the discouragement. And as you study into this and you get to digging into what's going on here, this, this lifting up the hands that hang down, uh, 
you study your Bible, Bible things come back to you. When you think about the hands that are down, what, what I think about is defeat. I don't, I don't typically think of the racer, but I think of defeat when I see the man's hands is down. That man's hands is down takes me back to Moses on the mountain while Joshua was down in the valley. And as long as Moses' hands are up, Joshua's being victorious. When the hands go down, they begin to lose the battle to the Amalekites. So, after a while of Moses not being able to hold them up from tired, weak, feeble, wore out, Aaron and Hur comes alongside and says, hey buddy, we got this, we're going to help you out. So they help hold his hands up. And as long as the hands are up, of course, the battle's being won. And we know the end, the end result of that was the battle was won because Moses' hand was up. Here's a guy that's run his race. He's gotten discouraged and his hands are down. So he says, lift up those. Now notice, notice this, and I got this in, in just the last little bit of my study here. He says to us, he's talking, remember he's talking to Hebrews here primarily, but he's also talking to us because the Bible's written for us. He says, wherefore? What's where there for? To look back at what we just talked about. They some folks that gets whippings, and then whippings can sometimes be discouraging to them because nobody likes to fail or fall short or not satisfy our our person of interest to our life. Here it's speaking of us running a race for our father and we fail in that race and we end up somewhere in that race getting a whooping and we get discouraged. So he says, lift up those hands. Wherefore, because they've been whipped and it was right to do so and it's to be a helper to them, you might need to go over and lift them up. Sometimes we as Christians need to help hold up the hands of others. God helped this generation to quit being about self. This ain't about self. If you're saved by the grace of God, the first thing you realized, it was about the Lord Jesus Christ. What he went through for you that you might have salvation. And obtaining that salvation, it should have directed your heart to be like Jesus and reach others. So it's no longer about self because we just settled that on Calvary with, the, with uh, Christ. So that's settled. Now it's about reaching others. So a good, good example of Christian living is reaching others, about others, not about self. But preacher, and that's the problem right there, but preacher, but get away from that. We, we sometimes will say, but you know, I, I, well, what about I? I got a problem. I need to get something helped out there. Quit eyeing and look at others. Look out. Look to other folks. Don't, don't keep that mirror. I was going down the road today. And God help us. I see, this, I see this woman, and she's cheesing. I thought, most of the folks is mully grubbing. And then I thought, dummy, she's doing a selfie. Dummy looks over, and sure enough, there she is. Doing a selfie. In her car going down the road. Put your phone in your pocketbook and drive. You hear me? Amen. Why in the world is it so important for her to do a selfie while she's riding down the road taking pictures? God help us all. By the way, that is against the law. Amen. Amen. Yes, I've checked mine a time or two going down the road, but I don't do selfies. In dealing with a case years ago, there was a, um, <laughs> quit, and <laughs> get me all tickled up about that mess. Hey, there, was a, there was a marital problem years ago, and, and the lawyers were involved, and things was going on, and I was familiar with the situation and the case that's going on. And when they began to, to dig into what all was going on, the lawyer made a comment, and I like to laugh myself out of the chair. She said, well, I can sort of tell what the problem is. With her phone records, she sure is stuck on herself because all she done was a bunch of selfies. All the time, selfies. I'm talking about everywhere in the house and, and all over, taking selfies. I thought, my soul, I don't like self that good. God bless you all, but I don't like my picture that good. 
Too, too, too much in the picture. Now you give me one of them phones that's got them corrector things on it that makes me look, we in business, baby. Give me one of them, I'm good. Nice and slim, good structured face, nice build, all that. Yeah, I'll be all right with that. But that ain't what comes up on my phone. But that's where we get into problems. And in this very text, we're going to deal with a man that was about self a lot more than he was about anybody else. We're going to read about him here in a few minutes. By the way, his name's Esau. So when you get to looking at this relationship of the text going back to the starting of the chapter, we're still in context, talking about running our race, what we can do for the glory of God, living our life for Christ, that's the race we're running. He comes in here at verse number 12. He says, wherefore lifting up them hands. So we know those hands talks about folks that are weak and defeated. And, and by the way, your reference for Moses is Exodus chapter 17, uh, verse number 11. So you see how that, that, that leads in. It leads into a time of discouragement. And when you do the word studies, and I'm not going to do all that and bore you with a bunch of Hebrew because we've got an English Bible, right? So if you look up the English word for them, you'll get a lot of that. I do understand studying Hebrew and the relation, how they tie together in other verse. I understand that. But you can also look at good Webster dictionary and get definitions that will be just as fitting. The Hebrew talks about those things. So we, we're not going to worry about the Greek. Or, well, actually here we're in the Greek rather than the Hebrew. Uh, but when you look at what these words mean, the definitions behind these, uh, this, this matter of the hands being down leads us into that of a discouraged servant. They're, they're discouraged. Well, when you look at this where he talks about the knees, the feeble knees, when you define that out, what he's talking about is about a set of knees that have not gotten weak from working, but the opposite. These feeble knees, when you study all of this out, this feeble goes to the word that we got, the word paralyzed. From this Greek word is where we get our word paralyzed. So it's talking about a set of knees that are locked up for lack of use. That changes things, doesn't it? Rather than running the race, rather than being on our knees like we should be, we've got locked knees, feeble knees, not functionable knees because we're not using them as we should. Amen. Amen. God help us. God help us. We, we, need, to, we, need, to, we need to use our knees more than what we're doing. Uh, I used to be around a lot of prayer warriors, and I'm guilty for not praying like I used to. I'm guilty. So the Lord, Lord working in our hearts about that, I need to pray more than, than I do. I used to... I used to uh, pray a lot more than what I'm doing. I pray now as I go in, in different time, but I need to set aside time. I need to set aside more time to pray than used to. You know, in, in, in the days gone by, it was not uncommon for preachers to pray two or three hours a night. I know of, of prayer meetings where uh, in view of revival or in the process of meetings that they would gather and they'd stay in there and pray for hours. Some folks prayed all night. Uh, Brother Lockhart in the inception of the church up there to get it going when he was up there in uh, Bronston, uh, when he started Bronston Baptist Tabernacle, getting it going. Uh, they would pray every Saturday, every hour, till Sunday morning service, every hour somebody was in the church praying. Every hour. Some folks would go in and take two hours. Some folks would take what they could an hour or less. That, but they kept somebody and they signed up for somebody was in that church praying throughout the whole Saturday night for the Sunday services. We need, we need to exercise our knees a little more. So, as I said, I'm not going to do a big English study on you, but when you look at the ending of verse number th uh, uh, 12, it ends with a semicolon. He's talking about, he's connecting things together here. And he talks about these that are, we need to lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet 
least by which, uh, which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. So he said, I'm talking about these that's discouraged and defeated and, and despondent on their duties. They're not doing things that they should be doing. And as a result, we're not having the straight paths that we should have. And in that straight path, what he talk, talks about there is those that have had problems being lame and not able to walk correctly. When somebody lays out a straight path, it brings forth healing to them. That's what he says there. He says, he says, and make straight the path for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. It means to get worse, that being turned out of the way talks about being out of joint. So he talks about this, this matter of, of folks that are lame and weak and feeble. If we'll make the straight paths, it will bring healing to them and it'll make it easier for them. And I, I made a little note, we need, to, we need to think about those that's coming behind us. We've got young folk coming behind us. It's a little easier to trip them up than it is the folks that are more diligent about their walk. So we've got, we've got to... <laughs> You know, keep our paths clean and straight so that they can, they can uh, see the easier way. This, this, this out of joint, uh, the word there, feeble, talks about paralyzed, and then making it straight talks about when it gets out of joint. So he's talking about, he's talking about our walk altogether goes back to verse one where he talks about us running a race. If we got feeble knees that are paralyzed, we can't run no race. If we get, if we get to uh, to these these places where we're not making the path straight, we can get out of joint. Impossible for us to run a race, and we need to be much about that. We need to we need to pay much attention to that, and and that getting out of joint relates to the body. We're all part of the body, so if part of us is out of the joint, what happens to the rest of the body? It hinders us. We can't work right like we need to. So it's important that each member of the body be be in right relationship with each other and walk in the straight path. When you when you when you study uh, that part about being paralyzed, the feeble knees, the paralyzation comes from an inability of the nerves, the brain getting a sensation that's necessary or signal necessary to the working part of the knee, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, and all these things that work, there's a problem between getting the message from here to here. Let's go spiritual. Who's the head? Christ. He's the head of the church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. He's the head of the church and we're the body. So for him to get the message to us, we've got to be doing some exercise so we're not paralyzed and we receive the signal from him. <coughs> a lot of problems that churches are having is some are functioning in their own doings without receiving the signal that they need to. We got to be getting it from the head. Amen. <coughs> Talks about our goal there about making the path straight so that we can we can run that race as we should. Um uh and get the healing that we need to in that. Then we come to verse 14. It says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now there's, there's some study here that you need to get a hold of, not just, not just try to figure out what you think that is by just gandering at it or scanning it or speed reading through it. You need to take some meditation when you study and you read this. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, when you get into this study, I'm going to give us a, a little bit more on that. But when you, when you look at this, this following peace with all men, my goodness, that is such a needed thing today. You know, there's, there's, there's so much attitude around now that we've, we've, we've advanced as we have with the technology. They've got Facebook and they're putting videos up of people and and people acting in a wrongful way, and Miss Karen, we love you, but you know they're using your name in a bad way now, don't you? They're calling people that gets all crazy and out of sorts a Karen, and that's wrong. It shouldn't do you that way, because I know better. 
but they're using that as a slain, a slamming to the character that people exercise. When they go nuts on somebody and they get crazy and loud and say things they really shouldn't ought to be saying, they call them Karens now. That's wrong. Y'all not do that. Y'all call them what they are. Loud and profane people. Amen. Amen. But but this 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 attitude would descend and decrease if we was doing verse 14. Follow peace with all man. Now, if y'all read that, can y'all read that? It says, follow peace with all men. Can y'all read that? Y'all see that? Now, you know that that all, y'all know what that means. Y'all studied that out, haven't you? I've told you, you've heard other preachers, you know, when you look at that Webster, all means all. I'm going to give you a minute because that's a tough one to swallow. Because he says, follow peace with all men. Now, he's not, he's not excluding the females. He's talking about men as mankind, mankind. So we're to have peace with mankind. That's the bad folks as well as the good folks. That's tough. Because some folks, you'd like to backslide for five minutes I know, I've, 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 I've thought about saying, Lord, can I have five minutes? Just, just give me five minutes and then draw me back and forgive me, okay? I need five minutes to deal with this, folks. You know, because we all get, at times, they was talking, we was talking to preachers, we was all cutting up a little bit the other night and talking about, uh, one feller talking about how that he went down the road and actually is a local preacher, but we're alive and I'm not going to call his name out, but he was going down the road thinking he was doing pretty good and he was thanking the Lord for helping him and that, that uh, you know, maybe he was beginning to mature a little bit and maybe he was beginning to get a little more grace about him and things was just going good and he was thanking the Lord for, for helping me grow a little bit and, and thought he was doing really good. Now, he wouldn't quite say he'd arrived, but he thought he was doing real good and about that time he got cut off. And he said, Oops. About the time I think I'm doing good, I find out I ain't as good as I thought I was because somebody had cut him off in traffic and he got a little upset with that. So uh, <clears throat> that has ways of getting our attention, doesn't it? And show us our true colors, who we are. Remember, we still bear the flesh. Amen. We still have to deal with that. So, But he's telling us to follow peace with all men. We ought to be peaceable people. And, and I get aggravated with the news medias and how they want to make Christians out to be the ugly, violent people, and we're not. Now, I think you ought to stand your ground. I think you ought to be able to protect your castle, which the laws of our land does give us that right. I think you ought to protect your castle. I'm not letting some heathen walk up in my house and abuse me, my family, and, and, and I'm going to defend my castle. I have that right and a God-given responsibility to defend my family. That's not what he's talking about following peace. He's talking about us not being unruly and just stirring up trouble and, 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 and to have peace with mankind. I cannot control what you do, but I can control my attitude on what you do. And that's what I'm responsible for. And even though you may do me wrong or, or, or whatever the case could be, I'm supposed to follow peace with all mankind. The exact example of that is the man by the name of Jesus Christ that they plucked out his beard, spit in his face, put a, put a uh, cover over his head, hood, hooded his head, slapped him and said, now who done that? And he could have whooped a whole bunch. I think he could have physically whooped a whole bunch. Usually you got a cow, crowd of cowards in that kind of crowd. So, and knowing who he is, of course he's got all power. He could summon the the power necessary and whooped a whole bunch, but he didn't, did he? Here's what he did. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in that response, now they've done that because he's claiming to be the son of God, not because he's at his house and they run up in there on him. Y'all hear me? He's not, he's not going through that process because it was necessary for his family, he's doing that because it's necessary for sinners. They persecute him for the Christian faith. And that's, there is a difference. There's a line drawn there. So 
God help us to have peace with all mankind. It's needed for us to be peaceable with other folks. If you will notice here, follow peace with all men, comma. He ain't done yet. He's still got something else to say about that. Follow peace with all men and holiness. There's a connection with peace and holiness. If you'll be honest, when you wasn't really where you need to be with the Lord, you didn't have peace. If you're saved by the grace of God and you're not living right, you're not trying to live in holiness, you're not trying to walk in righteousness, you didn't have the peace you should have. So peace and holiness go together. And it's, it's there together in this verse. And he's saying, uh, uh, follow, follow peace with all men and holiness. So we're to be holy. In other words, we're to live right. We're to, we're to do what's right with all men. Amen? Some folks, instead of blessing them out, we all be praying for them. Amen. A lot of folks are more ignorant of God's word and God's ways today than they ever have been. And there's Bibles on ever where you look. Where's the problem? I do believe Christians have backed off, backed up, and, and quit putting out the gospel like we should and quit teaching and preaching the gospel like we should. Because some folk ain't going to like it if you call them out on not being peaceable with all men. They get a little upset. And some of them won't do it because they're guilty themselves. I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm not always perfect. I get upset. Now, God's given me grace and God's helped me to keep that upsetness. You can put that in my dictionary that I'm writing. My upsetness... Uh, doesn't get out of the heart and the mind a lot of times because of the goodness of God and His grace and His help. Because I'm telling you, these times folk make me angry. I could just, amen, I could bite nails and spit bullets, praise the Lord. But, you know, the grace of God teaches us that we need to be peaceable with others. So we have to learn how to do that. Doesn't mean you got to be lack of backbone men, but you're to live in peace and, and, and holiness. Do what's right. If you'll follow what's right, you'll be right. You'll not be a coward. You'll not be crumbling under other things, but you'll be right. Just follow holiness. We got a whole Bible that te teaches us how to do these things. Holiness will we'll establish a perimeter of living for us. There's things we can't do and live holy. There's things that we shouldn't want to do and live holy. Amen? So God help us to follow peace with all men, uh, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now that's not talking about if you're not holy, you're not going to get to see Jesus at the, at the, at the uh, rapture or when you die and go to heaven. That's not what that's talking about. You can't have the presence of the Lord and enjoy His presence just like He tells us in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, our iniquities separate between us and God. First John tells us about our fellowship. He calls us sons and daughters. He, he puts us in the family and He tells us that if we got sin in our life, it messes up our fellowship. That's what First John's all about. So we're not going to see the Lord's presence. We're not going to see the Lord's power. We're not going to enjoy the Lord's peace if we're not walking in the holiness. So that's what He's dealing with there. And then he goes, ending of verse 14, back to our English lesson, is a colon. And here the colon is there. He's stopping the sentence that he's saying, but he's continuing the theme of what he's saying. So rather than a simple period and start a new sentence, he's saying, I'm done with this right here, but I want to carry on this same theme. And he goes from verse 14 to verse 15, if we follow in verse 14, peace with all men and holiness, we see the Lord. However, the contrast to that is in verse 15, looking diligently, if we're going to do that, we're going to be looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And that's another big topic right there. That, that verse is a major debate verse, and a lot of folks misuse that verse. And out of that context there, they twist it up and they say, you can lose your salvation. They say that word speaks of uh, least any man fail of the grace of God. 
<clears throat> now, one thing I want you to get a hold of right there real good. The Lord just showed me this. Get a hold of this real good. Least any man fail of the grace of God. Not that the grace of God failed. God's grace didn't fail. Least any man fail of the grace of God. Of course, you can get into the Greek word studies and all that. Uh, but let's, let's dissect it a little bit. Looking diligently. When he, when he says that, looking diligent, that puts us into the overseer, the oversight, looking after something diligently. Y'all know what diligently means. It's a, uh, a steady application and care. It means you're, you're, you're really delicately, diligently, you're, you're really looking at something. You really got your concentration and focus on that. What's he talking about, though? He says, looking diligently, least, least any man fail of the grace of God. What's he mean, failing of the grace of God? Word studies take you a whole long, long place when you get into that. Talks about this failing of the grace of God. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. I, I was doing my studies there. Phillips probably lays it out as good of, uh, John Phillips' book on Hebrews gives us a very good definition and, and writing on that, talking about that. He talks about us truly being uh, sanctified in our living means that we're uh, involved in living in the holiness of God and the dangers of not living in the holiness of God, we're going to fall short of the grace of God. So a fall from grace is possible, but not a fall from salvation. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about, now some's going to debate this and argue that. That's fine. If you disagree, that's fine. But first you've got to prove to me that you can lose your salvation. You're not going to be able to do that. For God so loved the world that he gave, a, gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I got everlasting life when I believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior and me a sinner. So what stops that everlasting life? Absolutely nothing. So with that in mind, remember when I started, you remember the cardinal principles. You can't never lose your salvation. Too many scriptures prove that. So he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about failing of the grace of God. So what is the grace of God? Somebody define grace for me. Y'all remember the acrostic for grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Things God gives to us that we don't deserve. So if we fail of that grace, then we're not obtaining or getting those things that we should be getting. Y'all remember, remember the guy on down there we're going to read about his name's Esau? Remember this least, ye, least man fail of the grace of God. It's going to go right into that. We're in chapter 12. Esau's uh, story is in chapter 12 in just a minute. Y'all understand what I'm saying? We're going to talk about Esau. Right now we're talking about the failing of the grace of God. Least any, verse 16 says, least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Now, since we're talking about failing of the grace of God, let's talk about Esau a little bit. I'm not talking about Esau's salvation. We're talking about Esau because Esau sold out his birthright and he lost out on the blessing. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about his birthright. What's the birthright? We'll deal with that in a minute. So we're going to look at all that. So this, 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 uh, failing of the grace of God is not speaking of the salvation point there. I don't believe. If you can show me different, then we'll sit down at the table and we'll, we'll debate this a little bit. That looking, we, uh, I'm sorry, that, that uh, failing of the grace of God, uh, so to fall from grace is possible. However, a person who falls from grace in this context is not a person who loses his salvation, but a believer who falls uh, fails to avail himself to the means of grace made available to him by God to help him in his Christian life, which means uh, of grace are the ordinances of baptism, Lord's Supper, fellowship with other believers, the Word of God, prayer, indwelling the Spirit of God, uh, and similar things. So the believer who neglects these things falls into sin and loses not his salvation but his reward. Now if you read into Esau... That's going to fit exactly what we just got done reading about when you study Esau. As you step forward into Esau. Now, remember, 
Verse 14 ends with a colon. Verse 15 ends with what? Semicolon. Hmm. So he's not done on this theme. We're not going to close this theme and start a new topic, right? Am I, am I right in my English study from colons and semicolons? <coughs> he's going to continue on. Sometimes the colon brings another verse or another sentence that will explain what was just talked about. Semicolon, we're not going to completely lose that subject. We're going to get a little further in it. So when you look at what he says there, least any fault fell of the grace of God, least any root of bitterness spring up you and trouble many, uh, or, or trouble you and thereby many be defiled. I've got to be careful here because I've preached several messages on bitterness and I'll end up in no mess, those messages and I don't want to do that in this study. You need to understand bitterness. He's using the root of bitterness, which is a tree uh, uh, that's going to grow. You've got to have a hole to put the seed in. You love somebody, something happens, it creates a hole because part of your heart's just been pulled out. There's a hole. That gives opportunity for the seed of bitterness to be sowed. That seed of bitterness grows under the earth. Nobody sees it. Later it develops into a full-blown bush or a full-blown tree. And you see the fruits thereby. But many have already been defiled by them. So it's going to trouble you and defile many others. If I possess a root of bitterness in my soul right now, I'm going to defile everybody in here because you're going to be around me. Just like a cold, it's going to get out. It's going to get on other folks. And that's what he's warning. He's telling us, follow peace with all men and holiness. Peace is an opposite. It's an antonym of bitterness. That bitterness is, I'm going to get them. And in my message I used that I was given many years ago by another preacher, takes you back to the study of a man by the name of Ahithophel, which was Elam's daddy, which was Bathsheba's daddy. And when you study that passage out, you'll see that Bathsheba went through a great loss because of the sin of David, and Ahithophel, her granddaddy, got bitter over the situation. So you end up with a problem. So bitterness, bitterness is a bad seed. It comes because of love or care, and that's, that's the good of it. But when that seed gets in there, it'll, it'll develop, and it causes major troubles, major troubles. And it'll, it'll involve a lot of other folks. Now, when you, when you don't heed verse 14, you end up with a verse 15. That's the colons there. Then in, in the middle of verse 15, you got a semicolon. He talks about looking diligently, least any man fail of the grace of God, least any root of bitterness spring up in you. He's talking about, I'm talk, telling you the same thing. You can have bitterness and you can fail of the God, God's grace. Same, the same core theme is bringing out two different results. You fail of the grace of God and you end up with a root of bitterness. You see that? That's the colon, semicolons in there. <clears throat> That's working in that. And, and man, it, it's, it's so, so prevalent uh, in lives today because people's been hurt every way they go. Now, a lot of folks carry their emotions on their shoulders and they're waiting on somebody to hurt their feelings. Really. Uh, you know, I've been married 35 years, dated her four years ahead of that, and still married her. Y'all think she was perfect? Y'all believe her little she's an angel story? Something wrong with you. <laughs> you think I always done her perfect in them four years? No, absolutely not. But we still married each other. We've been married 35 years. So we've done each other wrong a time or two through the years. But we learn how to deal with that and not let something cause a great division there. And when you, when you forgive and ask for forgiveness, you can keep that process of work just fine. And it makes it work good for people. Amen. So when you, when you see the possible problems that can come in there, then he goes on and to really bring this thing to, uh, to, a, to, a, to a climax, to a head, to bring it to a, here's my point. Y'all remember Esau? Verse 16. At least there be any fornicator or profane person. 
And when you get into the study of Esau, there's a, there's a lot there. Uh, you think about the Christian that he's talking about, this Christian that's going on, this Christian that's got perseverance in their life, this Christian that's got potential of reaching much of God's grace, but sometimes they fail of it. Uh, their hands get heavy. Their knees get free, uh, frail where they don't work right. They're feeble. Uh, we've, got the, we've got the possibility of power with God, and sometimes we miss it because we don't take the right trail. We get upset when God disciplines us. We're all still in chapter 12. And if we don't get those things right, bitterness can rise up. We'll fail of God's grace. And then you get talking about Esau and man, what Esau missed out. When you study Esau, when you study what goes on in Esau's life. Now, there's two applications here when you study this of Esau. It says, least, least there be any fornicator or profane person. Now, we know that fornicator is sexual misconduct. Literally speaking, physically speaking, that's a sexual misconduct. And some people only use it as a spiritual implication here, that it's speaking of a spiritual misconduct to love on other gods, etc., rather than having God first. So you can use two, both applications. Most commentators want to try to use it mainly as a spiritual application, and I agree in that respect. Because we're in a spiritual book, he's trying to make some spiritual, but I also know there's practical applications too. Esau wasn't a good man. Esau was about Esau. Esau was a very fleshly man. Esau was concerned about self, like we talked about a while ago. He's the guy that's got the camera. All about Esau. He's the best hunter. He's the best getter of the game. Uh, he's got daddy's heart because he can kill deer and bring them in and all this and Esau's the man, seemingly full of pride. When you study Esau, you've got a literal meaning there of the fornicator to have sexual misconduct outside of marriage. That is still a sin. Same as adultery, sex, wrong sex with other people in marriage. Still a sin. When you study Genesis 25, you get the story of him, and it talks about being a fornicator. It talks about being a profane pro person. Uh, this profane person deals with someone that has despised or trampled underfoot holy things. They despise the holy things. They trample underfoot holy things. Folks that, that has nothing or thinks nothing of a church don't mean nothing to them sort of like the thieves we've had around here lately, to steal gas from you or to steal gas from John or Ralph or Susie or Sally or whoever else, that's bad. That's a wrong thing to do. But to do it from a church, that's trampling underfoot holy things. That's profane. That's, that's worse than the worst. And when you, when you study these out, you, you've, got, you've got a lot to look at here. Two things that Esau did. One, he sold his birthright. Remember, he come back, made like he's about to die. If he didn't get something to eat, he's going to die, so he sells his birthright. He done that because he despised it. <coughs> Why didn't he make some other bargain? Why didn't he try to trade some other way? Why didn't he just say, Brother Esau, you're my brother, man. Can't you just let me have something to eat? Why did he come to the... I'll sell you my birthright. Y'all remember what the birthright is? That's, that's a God-set ordinance. It's a godly thing. That birthright meant that that firstborn son got a double portion of father's wealth. He's willing to sell off his birthright that Isaac's his daddy. He's willing to serve off, sell off his birthright that he's the firstborn of Isaac. He don't want to carry that responsibility, that priesthood of the home. Isaac dies, Esau becomes the head of the family. So in selling that birthright, he said, I don't want to be responsible for y'all. He's about himself. So the selling of the birthright, and then there was the other thing that come up, which was the blessing. Now, when you read these verses, I want you to get a hold of this. He says that who for the morsel of meat sold his birthright. For we know that afterward, not at the birthright time, but afterward, another time, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he saw for it carefully with tears. Now let me give you something here real good. A lot of people try to make out like that, that Esau could not repent. 
A lot of people will take this text right here and say Esau was a wicked, wicked man and he had no place of repentance. Now, Genesis 25 gives you the story that goes to this and you ought to read the story. What repentance did Isaac or did uh, Esau seek? Does anybody remember? Wasn't his, was it? His wanting his daddy to repent of the decision that he made to give the blessing to Jacob. See that that blessing that went that blessing that come down on Jacob that that Jacob asked for was that of being the heir of the covenant of the family, which is the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go read your Matthew and Luke Gospels and read the, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't find Esau's name in there. You find Jacob. By Jewish law, it should have been Esau. He's the firstborn. He's the carrier. He lost that. He went to his daddy to try to get his daddy to repent of the decision of laying the blessing on Jacob. And daddy said, I can't do that. So he found no place of repentance, though he sought for it with tears. I'm sure he dramatized the event very well. It still didn't change the fact. Jacob had done give the blessing. I mean, Isaac had done give the blessing to Jacob, and he couldn't take it back. He sought for repentance of his daddy. And he couldn't get it. You can't get somebody else's repentance. Your youngins need to repent the same as you do. Amen. I can't use the repentance my daddy did to get me to heaven. I've got to repent myself. That's on the matter of repentance. But the repentance sought here was that Isaac would go back on what he had done with Jacob and give it to Esau. He did want the blessings. He did seek for the blessings. So let that sink in. That might, that might put a little, that might put a little uh, <clears throat> stick in your spokes there, but um, he did seek for that. He wanted that blessing. He had sold the birthright, but he was trying to get the blessing back. He asked for repentance there. One deals with a future position. The other dealt with a future posterity, which was the children, the lineage there was a promised seed to come down from Abraham, remember? And all through that seed line, there's a promise that there's a king coming. His name's Jesus. Esau is now kicked out of that lineage, and Jacob was put in, and that's what Esau was seeking for his father to repent of and to put him back in there. He sought for his daddy to repent, not himself. So when you, when you study out these, these scriptures, I'm going to quit. When you study out these scriptures, make sure you stay in the context. That's what I've done tonight. I've stayed within the context of chapter 12 as well as the context that goes throughout the theme of the Bible. And when you study it in that respect, you'll get the proper uh, meanings or the, the, the tro- proper intent that God has in the writings. Um, nobody can lose their salvation period, dot, end of story. Throughout the scriptures, we've got multiple scriptures many times over that it proves that a man can't lose his salvation. Fail of the grace means he comes short of some of the grace of God that God's got for him. There's graces that God's got for us. No doubt I've failed of God's grace of some things. I've missed some, I've missed some blessings he had in the way because I went wayward it for a while. So, you study these out in context. It's, uh, it's necessary to get the understanding that God has for us. What's he trying to talk about? He's talking about us running our race. Run our race with patience. Run our race and be peaceable with all men. Run our race and not be profound and fornicators such as Esau was. Not live like the Esau. Not be about self, but be about winning the race for Christ. In chapter 12... Shows us running the race, messing up, correction, getting back on the trail, staying on the trail, how to stay on the trail, follow peace with all mankind, follow holiness. You know, a lot of folks look for what they can get by with rather than what God wants them to do. 
A lot of youngins look for what they can get by with. That's why mamas and daddies foolishly count. That's one. That'll be two. Now, you know if I get to five, you're going to get a spanking. So they got three more chances. Okay. Like I say, folks look for what they can get by with rather than what they can do that's right. God help us to follow his direction here. Follow peace with all men and holiness. So let's take the man part out of it, instead of peace and man. Let's take that out. He's saying follow holiness. So we ought to be following holiness. And in doing so, we can have a good life. We can have, have the presence of the Lord. We can see the Lord. Uh, we can get healing when we get lame. We, we get all kinds of pluses there. The opposite side of that is, is pay attention to what's about us. I didn't, I didn't lay this all out. I meant to. Looking diligently means to look with anticipation or expectation. We got an enemy, right? Y'all do know the church has an enemy. Are we looking for him? Earnestly, diligently. Which way is he coming in next? Which way is he going to hit me next? Looking diligently. Always looking for and expecting an attack from the enemy. And we get comfortable, we get complacent, and we think, oh, we're all right. And this is the worst place we do that. See, we call this a sanctuary, which is an, which is an expected place of peace and protection. And sometimes we have to listen to what Apostle Paul told us to beware of the dogs that sneak in. We've got to beware of the wolves that sneak in wearing sheep's clothing. So you have to be careful with things. You have to be looking for it. As an overseer, looking for those things. As a father over his family, looking for where's the bad guy going to get in on my family. I don't want him to get in. I want to be able to protect my folks from the bad guys and those that would wrongfully use our stuff or our peoples. Amen. Same in spiritual. We need to be looking for the devil. How's he going to get in? Let's not let him get in. Let's build up a hedge of protection through prayer and peace with each one. So, good little, good little study there with us. We'll, we'll probably catch a few of verse 18 through 29. Uh, maybe a little bit of that uh, when we get back to it. Like I say, next week we'll have Brother Joe Hendricks uh, preaching for us. And if you have questions with any of these things, I haven't mentioned that lately. If you've got questions with these things, ask me. I don't mind. I'll sit down. We'll discuss it. We'll go over it. We'll learn together. I'm not always perfectly 100% right. Don't y'all tell Judy I said that. <clears throat> but uh, I'm not. I'm not always. You know, I can, I can be off on things. But when we get into some things that really it's not salvational things, it's okay once in a while for us to disagree on something. Some things we're going to disagree on. I might think your hair ought to be a certain length and you think it ought to be another length. What's that got to do with salvation? Absolutely nothing. One preacher thinks all the preachers are supposed to wear a white shirt in the pulpit. So obviously I disagree. It's okay. That's his preference. It's okay. Some places require certain colored uniforms that they wear. Some places require other kind of uniforms. But they do require some kind of uniform code. Everybody goes to work has got a uniform code. A lot of folks argue that, no, I, don't, I can wear what I want to. Well, you go in there without wearing what you want to and, and go in there without good proper clothing on and see what the boss man says. Like Roloff said, uh, you've all got standards. I just got higher standards than you. How many of you want to fly on an airplane with a drunk pilot? See, you got standards. Some may not be as strong as others, but that's, you know. So, study your Bibles. Know your Bibles. Be able to, be able to debate and talk about some of these things. I mean, I'm telling you, you get into Esau, there's lots of debate. You can get into a lot of debating on Esau. Whether he went to heaven or hell. They say, I mean, there's a lot of debates on these all. Good stuff to study about. So, study your Bibles. Amen? I thank you for being here tonight. Let's look at some prayer requests <coughs> this evening. Um, let me mention a few by first. Please pray. Remember my surgery Tuesday. Um, pray that all goes well. It's not supposed to be a complicated surgery, but it's surgery. And since it's on me, it's a major surgery. 
Hey, man, if you was going through it, we'd call it a minor surgery. It'd be all right, but since it's on me, it's major. Uh, but pray all goes well, and uh, he can alleviate the problems and hopefully fix what causes the pain from time to time. Uh, we do disagree a little bit there. I think there's a presence of a kidney stone from time to time, and he doesn't agree because he ain't seen the picture of it. So he don't live by faith. He has to see the facts. But uh, the pain that I have matches kidney stone, so we, we're, we're debating on that one. But anyway, till one shows up, I can't, I can't get him to go that route. But there's nothing to do right now anyway on that. But he, there is a problem he's going to go in and fix. So uh, pray for us on Tuesday. Um, also, remember Miss uh, Shirley's got hers on the 16th. Uh, she'll be going to Baptist and doing yours, right? Foresight. Foresight's doing it. Great folks at Foresight, too. They, they're, I think, probably the best on hearts in the country around this part anyway. Uh, they, they're good. But uh, pray for her on her, her procedure they'll be conducting there at uh, Foresight on the 16th. Um, pray for Brother Hendricks be preaching for us Wednesday night. And um, I've got another preacher coming at the end of the month. I think you'll enjoy him. He's out of Israel. And I think that'll be something you'll really enjoy uh, when he comes and preach for us. And then pray for June. Let the Lord move in that. Pray, pray with me on the preachers to back it up. I'm going to do a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday service in the morning for the preachers primarily. You're welcome to come. But his theme is going to be primarily to the preachers. And uh, we're going to throw, throw together a little meal of some sort. Um, after that, every, every day for dinner time, so we'll work on that at lunchtime, right? So some of you don't get confused. I'm breakfast, dinner, and supper, but some folks think dinner is at seven o'clock, and you probably not read your Bible lately. But anyway, because um, the Lord had to supper in the evening. Just, just so y'all know, I didn't know if y'all know that, but so we do breakfast, dinner, and supper. But anyway, uh, pray about that meeting. Pray the Lord can help. Because uh, I'm fellowshipping with some once a month, and, and I'm just telling you, uh, with my experience throughout the years, uh, Brother Johnson and them guys met 40 years, and, and, and they was faithful in their meeting for 40 years. And I was in it for many years uh, with their fellowship, and, and preachers struggle the same as you do. Uh, preachers have problems to deal with the same as you do. Most preachers' problems starts on Sunday night about 9 o'clock, and the last till about Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. Depression, discouragement, defeat. Um, that's a common path that preachers go through on Sunday night till Tuesday. And then the Lord helps them and they get over it and they get back in the saddle on Wednesday and they encourage a little bit for Sunday and boom again. So they cycle. Um, so pray, pray that God can give some help uh, in the June meeting to the preachers, and they'll come. So pray much about that. All right, new request that we need to mention tonight. Okay. All right, pray much about that, and he'll get seen if he needs to. Get that, get that looked after. Uh, but while he's hurting, it's a good time to get seen. Not when it quits and there ain't no evidence. So pray for, pray for Brother Robert in that respect. All right, anyone else got a request to see him? Miss Shirley? Two-year-old baby. That would be very, very tough for a two-year-and-a-half-year-old to deal with. So pre please pray for that, especially in the summertime with it hot. And uh, I've been fortunate through the years I haven't had to wear a cast, but they say they itch and sweat and stink and aggravate and so on. So uh, I don't like restriction, and I know I wouldn't like a cast. So uh, pray for that little old youngin. God help him. Uh, the Lord touch and help there. All right, someone else? Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah, there was an 18-year-old that drowned yesterday, so remember that family and pray about that. Awful young to, to go through that, so pray much about that one. Yes, ma'am? Remember uh, West Iredale girl, she's been battling cancer for several years, and yeah, she's been through a lot. So pray much for uh, Lockley, the Lord touch and help in that situation. Uh, give her strength. Remember friend, uh, Dennis Harris, he's home, but he had heart heart attack and they stented him. So pray all goes well and he heals up good. Anyone else we need to mention this evening? Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right, remember to pray about that situation. You got to be pretty desperate for that. Young folk, remember to pray for our young folk. Our young folk need help severely. Um, several weeks ago, the superintendent stepped over and spoke with us at the lunch table down at Boxcar and thanked me for, for bringing to his attention some issues with the computers in the schools. And um, I've talked in depth a little further. There's a mess of trouble going on amongst our kids, and there's a lot of prayer needed for our young folk. Um, the discouragement, depression, suicidal trends uh, in young folk now, it's, it's terrible. And uh, I've got a burden. We got, to get, we got to get the young folk in here. We got to give them some help. Get them in here means we can teach them about Jesus. Jesus loves them. Jesus gives hope. Jesus will, will mend the hearts. Jesus, Jesus is the miracle worker. They need to be here to hear that. So God help us to reach them. Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. Right. Pray for truth. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a lot of deception within that, and y'all know that already, but pray much for your vote, and vote. Bless your heart, get out there and vote. Uh, to be a good Christian, you've got to exercise your right to vote. Seriously. You know God, and God leads you, so you need to be voting. Amen? So please, get out there and vote. Vote, vote biblically. Ask God to give you wisdom and leadership in some of these folks, and, and vote. Uh, there's major, major stuff on the ballot this time. I think Stacefield's mayor's up, and a lot of the council that goes in there is up. You got three commissioners that's up. Um, one of those is seeking re-election. The other two stepping down. So you got three spots in the commissioners. There's ten running for it. You need to know them. You need to know what they're about. Not what they're talking today, but what they've been about. You can look at some history and find out who people made of. You know. And uh, you need to do that. You need to study. Know what you're looking for. Know how to vote and vote correctly. And, and seek God in it. We seek God in other decisions. God give you peace on who to vote for. And uh, I printed off my ballot today so I could look at it and study some of those, uh, the Senate races. I don't know all of them that's running in all those things. So I'm going to study and seek God to help me to know who's who and what they stand for. It's pretty easy now. You can, you can look at one or two topics and sort of see what you're looking at. Fair if they're, if they're anti-abortion, they're good folks, amen, uh, and pray about that. Y'all know the news. The news is up. Somebody leaked out the information that they was fixing to overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, it's been a 40-some a year, 50-year plague on America, and uh, I'm thankful that we got some folks in there that's, that's uh, looking to turn this thing around. Amen. There's nothing right. that they, they, The other crowd calls themselves pro-choice, right? Well, they need to make the choice the night before. Then they don't have to kill somebody. And the law is this. If I get drunk 
and run over a pregnant lady and kill her and the baby dies inside her, they charge me with a double homicide. That's hypocrisy if they believe in the right to abort. That's a live individual. When that baby becomes a baby in there, that's a live individual. And at any point that you take to choose to destroy that life, you've committed a murder. That's what I believe. That's my heart. It's murder. I've seen it when they started this mess, and it's ugly. We've seen videos of it years ago. It's ugly. You mamas couldn't stand it. It puts you in trauma for a month if you've seen one of those videos. It, you, it would, I'm telling you. Uh, Judy White would have nightmares for ages if she saw the video of what they actually do to them babies. And they even said today that what they're trying to get passed in some of the abortion states is to abort after birth. After the baby's born, then take his life. How in the world you don't call that murder? Same reason they don't call it murder if it's in the womb. God knowed the babies when it's formed in their mama's womb. Amen. John the Baptist at six months in the womb was full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, yeah, they live peoples there. Praise the Lord. If you ask a mama that's carried one, she'll tell you these live peoples in there. Uh, amen. So pray about that. Pray that that goes through and we can turn this around. I think God will bless America. Well, I know God will bless America if they can get that thing turned around. Amen. You know God's been unhappy since whenever that went in, 74? I think it's 74. So pray about that. Pray that will come through the way that it's headed and there will not be a stoppage of it. Pray your president gets saved by the grace of God. That's what needs to happen. Get him saved. Get to get some of his faculty around him saved. We'd have a good, good going country. I believe. I believe he could be a good man if he gets saved. It's supposed to change your heart, ain't it? So if he gets saved, born again, Amen. We'd be in good shape. So pray God save him. Pray he'll let God save him. <laughs> you know, he'll heed. I believe God convicts. I don't have a problem believing that. I believe God convicts. So pray the Lord will. Continue to work on him and president get saved. All right. Anyone else got a request tonight before we go? Yes, ma'am, Miss Sue. There's several there at Oswald that's had uh, E. coli and different complications with it. Uh, preacher's been bad sick. Uh, so pray for Brother Wesley, Lord, to help him in a great way and get over it. His mother's uh, battling it now. And there was some other folks sick, but they didn't have it quite as bad as he's had it or the same effects. So much prayer on that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. All right. Remember Miss Kay. She was having another issue too. But uh, anyway, pray much for Miss Kay. Pray to the Lord to help Miss Kay Ayers. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, pray about that. And remember her special request the other week. Amen. Pray the Lord moves. Amen. I'm talking about the other one.